It'll certainly help you if you have 1 Timothy 3 open uh, in front of you as we consider together uh, these two particular functions that uh, we see within the church uh, here as Paul writes to Timothy, who is a young pastor at the church in Ephesus. Uh, Timothy has been sent there to sort some things out. The church has become uh, a bit of uh, disarray. Uh, there's various issues that have cropped up, particularly with the presence of false teachers coming amongst them. And it is into that context we need to remember that Paul is writing to Timothy to say, let's get the teaching and the leading of the church set right. Because Paul is concerned that the church in Ephesus looks healthy. And he says there are then these two offices, two functions that God has given to the church to help the church especially. Therefore they're certainly worthy of us thinking about together this morning, particularly as well as we know we are uh, as a membership here uh, considering uh, calling another man to come as co-pastor uh, here at the church. Uh, a pastor is first and foremost an elder of the church. It's translated here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 as overseer, uh, but pastor, overseer, elder, they're used almost interchangeably through the New Testament and it's trying to describe the different functions that an elder have, although we also do see uh, in Ephesians, 5, uh, Ephesians 4, sorry, uh, God says that he does give particularly the gift of a pastor or pastors to the church, those who are particularly called to watch over the fellowship more closely. Pastor is a shepherd. And they are to especially uh, care for and minister among uh, the church. Uh, you've probably never heard it referenced, uh, that the Global Board of Church Leaders, it's because unless I've just invented something, it doesn't exist. Uh, there isn't an organisation that churches go to uh, and refer back to the entire time to get authorization for the things that take place in a church. Uh, there isn't another body that sits above the church here that we go and say, right, you know, how should Tollgate Evangelical Church be run? And the simple reason for that is this, is that in, we, we see in the, in the Bible that church leadership works like this. There is God, and then there is his church. There is no one that gets in between the church and serving God. There is no role for a priest, a mediator, to stand between God and the church because that role is, is carried out by the Lord Jesus Christ as being our high priest. And we find that the church in the New Testament is described as priests. We all have access to God. There's no in-between. It is God and his church. But what we do find is that the, the church in different local areas, is, the pattern is, is established in scripture of there being those who are set up in the local church to give some sort of leadership and direction among the fellowship. And that's inevitable, isn't it? You do need people who are going to take lead and accountability at some point. We, we do live in a culture that has a, a, a real crisis with making decisions and taking responsibility. And there does have to be that. You do need people to sit out in that role because otherwise what ends up happening is the church just becomes a complete free-for-all and the church never stays together when there are all kinds of different ideas, agendas and preferences being spouted left, right and centre. There are times where, you know, even amongst us here, it, it feels a little bit like herding cats as we all sort of go have a different idea, different ideas and preferences. We come with different backgrounds and understandings and, and, you know, and then there's everybody going off on different holidays at different times and trying to work out where everybody is at any given time can sometimes be challenging. But we can also give thanks that the church stays together for the unity that we've expressed and known and enjoyed over many years here as a church, the good grace that has been amongst us and that in large part has been due to the type of leadership, particularly that we've seen exemplified in Ian through his pastoral ministry here over those 28 and a half years. And we can give, great, give to God thanks for that and for the rich blessing that that has been to us here as a church. 
We do need to point out that in church leadership, the role of apostles, which is something we see in the New Testament, no longer exists. Um, we, we're told that apostles in Acts chapter 1, when they look at calling a new apostle uh, to take Judas's place, Acts chapter 1, verse 22, Peter says that you know, when they're going to consider who's going to be an apostle, who gets the role, it is the person, Peter says in Acts chapter 1, verse 22, who has been with them from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry and had seen the resurrected Lord Jesus in the body. Well, there's nobody alive on the face of the earth today who can say, I've seen the risen Lord Jesus bodily. It's not possible. Why? Because Jesus is in heaven. So, and even when you look in the, uh, some of the letters, uh, Peter uh, writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. John writes in, the, in, 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 in 2 and 3 John, two of the letters that he writes to churches. They, though though they, they were disciples and apostles, they call themselves elders. They could have said, oh, as an apostle, I'm going to command this to you. But they say, no, as an elder, I appeal to this. To fellow elders, as, I, uh, as an elder, I appeal to the church. This is what you're supposed to do. Why? Because there is a pattern of elders being set up in churches and, the, and particularly uh, taking accountability uh, for them. The other role we see, as we mentioned here, is that, that of deacons, and we'll come to think about uh, them a little bit together this morning. Uh, but there is this two, two, these, these two offices seen in the church, elders and deacons. And it makes sense, doesn't it, that God creates an order. After all, God is a God of order. He created order in the home. And in fact, the home is something that's re- mentioned a few times isn't it, in this passage. Talking about the husband, is, he's supposed to, to lead his home well. That is a picture. The church is a home. It is a family. It is God's family. So God says there's going to be an order in how this, how this functions. That being said, who makes the decisions in a church? Well, it's not always the elders. There are certain things that the elders of a church or the, and the deacons in a church will make decisions about. But the, the decisions of the church are made by the church, by the membership of the church here. And the decisions of who to appoint as an elder or a deacon, that is made by the church. It is the church who recognise people into membership of the church. It is also the church who remove those from membership, those who need to come under discipline. It is the church who determine how the building is used, how the finances of the church are spent, how the resources are used. That's why at our church members' meetings, there might be there are proposals made by elders or the deacons, and then there is a vote. That's why, actually, if you're a church member, it's good to turn up at the church members' meetings because you are the ones that have a say in how the church functions here. And generally, it's by majority, if, if, if by majority vote, uh, things are then put into place and done among the fellowship here. It isn't the case that whatever the elders say happens or whatever the deacons think takes place. We'll come to that, though, uh, a little later on. And the role and the function, particularly the elders, is to make sure that the church sticks to this book, sticks to Jesus, stays close to God, does what God says and looks like and (laughs) functions like his church. It is always a danger, isn't it, when you hear churches being described as being that is so-and-so's church that's pastor so-and-so's church well we know what they mean by that don't we but really what we need to make sure is we understand the church is God's church that's why there are at times you we need to have it we also need to remember that the elders of the church they don't though they serve among the church they don't serve the church the elders role is to serve God is to honor him first And that needs to be something that we remember in all things. But we're going to think together just fairly uh, briefly this morning uh, about, first of all, uh, the the leadership of the church is made up with elders. As I said, verse 1 there of chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 3, the the phrase there used is overseer. 
Uh, but it's simply describing someone who looks over the church. In fact, just turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, because I think Peter here in 1 Peter 5 really clearly explains what the role of an elder in a church is. 1 Peter chapter 5, and we read from verse 1. Here's with that example of Peter calling himself an elder, by the way, instead of using apostle, like he could have done. 1 Peter 5, Peter says this, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording over, over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Peter says to the elders, this is your primary function. You are to shepherd the church of God that is under your care. You're to watch over them and you're to do it willingly. I mean, the last thing anybody wants to be doing in the church is, is serving in an unwilling way. You, you, you're to watch over the church, shepherd. Well, actually, the picture he picks up there in verse 4 is the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus. He says, actually, how are elders supposed to lead and care for the church? They're supposed to be, in some measure, like Jesus. How does Jesus shepherd his people? Well, if you want to have an interesting study, go and take it some time this afternoon and go and think about how Jesus cares for his people when we saw him ministering on the earth. What did he do? Well, actually, he dealt with people very gently. He dealt with people where they were in terms of their own situations and backgrounds. He, he wasn't ashamed to declare what was good and true. He wasn't afraid to rebuke at times. He wasn't afraid to stand up to those who were teaching error and condemn them for it. But he does also encourage those who know him and love him to, to do good things. He did as well do many practical good things amongst the people too. And so all of those elements are, should be ideally seen within and from the elders. Uh, we also read in Ephesians chapter 4 uh, that where Paul lists uh, a number of gifts that God gives to the churches. He mentions apostles, teachers, pastors, evangelists, and he says God gives them to the church so that the church might be built up. The church might be equipped. The church might know what is good and right and understand God better and more. We need to understand first of all about elders is that they are to have a real heart for the people of God in any one place. <coughs> They're going to carry the people on their hearts. They're going to feel a burden for the people in their church in that place. There's going to be prayer. There's going to be tears. There's going to be laughter and joys that are shared. There's going to be a walking alongside. There's going to be, at times, maybe a stern word, but it's going to be in season. It's going to be encouragement. One of the things that sort of floored me slightly was that very first Sunday we all got back together, particularly uh, when churches were opened up a couple of years ago. Um, we were just about holding it together as I stood up here to lead the service. Why? Because we realise just how much we love, you know, the purpose of uh, elders should love the church. And there should then also be a love that is had from among the church to the elders, pastors who serve well amongst us too, as there has been and rightly was so over with, with Ian. But who, who are the elders then? Who who? Who, who, who can become an elder? Who is someone that's supposed to have a heart and a desire to serve and to lead among the church? Well, the, well Paul gives us, doesn't he, a whole load of uh, qualifications back in 1 Timothy 3. He, he lists a whole number of things, and, and many of them are quite obvious, aren't they? I mean, he talks about being 
uh, above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, uh, someone who's going to, who manages their own home well, someone who isn't a recent Christian, so, so not, not a baby Christian, but someone who has at least some experience, someone who's got a good reputation with people outside of the church as well. There's a whole load of things here, and, and what we need to point out is that, that Paul clearly says that, what, that the, 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 the qualifications for an elder are mainly, right, mainly character. It is the character of the man that is supposed to stand out most clearly. That's why we don't appoint people to the eldership here at the church in the hope that they will become better. Well, we appoint people because we recognise that they do do these things or not do these things, right, in the right, in the right ways, already. It is a re- the church recognises and then the church together appoints, calls, sets apart some, those who are supposed to sit in leadership of the church. And why? It's because their character is such that actually they are a good example. Or they're supposed to be. It is worth noting as well that if you desire to be an elder in the church, and this is for men, if you desire to be an elder in the church, actually we're told there in verse 1, it's a noble task. It's a good thing. It is a privilege to be able to serve God amongst his people, caring for the church, helping to encourage and teach. It's a good thing. But it isn't something that necessarily everybody will be doing. In fact, in any church, there's usually very few elders. Most people aren't. But it is a good thing. As we look down the list, though, of qualifications there, we do need to point out there are some absences that we might naturally assume or want to read into that. We might expect that Paul would say, well, you can't pick anybody under the age of 45. After all, elder implies that this is someone with some degree of experience, isn't it? So maybe we should say, well, the elders can only be those over 60 or over 70 if they're in the church. No, Paul doesn't specify an age. Neither does he specify health requirements, for which I'm remarkably thankful for. Uh, There are a number of other things that are just absent from the list here. Paul says you're looking for someone who really is characterising what it means to be a Christian. Because actually this list is not extraordinary, is it? But rather it is the evidence of a heart that genuinely knows and loves the Lord Jesus. In that sense, when we look down this list, we we don't need to go, uh, it's okay, only the elders need to worry about not being drunkards or violent. It's only the elders who need to be gentle. I don't need to worry about it. No. No, there's various other places that teach that that is the case for every Christian. Oh, it's okay. It's only elders who need to be committed to their wife. I, I don't need to worry. I can commit adultery. No. This is... This is that they they, they, they dis- clearly display what it means to be a real Christian. It does sit, by the way, we need to point out there, when it talks about there in verse 4, is, uh, sorry, verse 2, as being faithful to his wife, that the translation is, a, is, 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 is literally this, a one-woman man. What that means is, if, a husband, if, he's, if he's a husband, he's going to be faithful to his wife. And if he's not married, he is also still a one-woman man in that the way that he is he approaches and treats other women is in complete respect with the institution of marriage and the intention of that, unless, you know, unless particularly gifted with singleness. But he'll still act in that same way. Instead, there is probably just one thing, particularly on this list, that stands out as being a unique qualifier for elders and it's there as we see in verse 2 it's right at the end able to teach that is someone who is going to be able to teach God's word correctly faithfully diligently who's going to not just take things out of context and apply them uh, wildly and, and inaccurately someone who's going to seriously consider what God says and make sure that they're scrutinizing the whole of scripture 
to bring that to the church. And the character of a man should will then demonstrate whether that's really being the case or not. If they don't understand the scriptures, their, 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 their character isn't going to match up with it. The two things go hand in hand, which is why public teaching has to be seen. And that, that's what Paul is talking about here. Elders are those who teach. They're, they're going to be to having a public ministry among the church, a teaching ministry to some extent, whether it be you know, leading the services, uh, leading in midweeks, maybe doing some studies, maybe occasionally preaching. It doesn't, an elder doesn't have to be preaching all the time in a church. We don't need to worry about that. But there's going to be some very public ministry that's carried out. And it needs to be tested. Because it doesn't mean, that, by the way, just because you've not been able to preach men, it doesn't mean uh, that because you've never preached before that you might never be an elder in a church. God does develop gifts. Gifts change, they grow, and they can uh, be, 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 be come to the fore at other points. Why, in the church, we will need to, at different times, give time for other men to come and preach here. Time for men, even from among the church, to, to preach and to lead. Because we want to, to test, to see, are there gifts that God is developing amongst us here to be future elders, leaders here amongst us? I mentioned a few moments ago that this is obviously a role that is meant for men. And the reason for that is, by the way, if you just flick your eyes back to verse 12 of chapter 2, just, I'll just eyes up the page, chapter 1 Timothy 2, uh, verse 12. Uh, Paul says this, I do not allow a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. So this, Paul is saying that there is an order in the church. There is a headship. It is men are supposed to be taking those public offices of leading and teaching the church. Ladies, that doesn't mean you can't teach in any setting. Lovely to see different ones of you teaching in spotlight and engage in the creche, ladies teaching other ladies and supporting one another. But also there are other roles that ladies you can have in the fellowship. As you continue to model godly character yourselves and set examples to one another and to the fellowship at large. As you pray in our prayer meetings, <coughs> as you're involved in the matters of the church, those of you who are have been, will be, pastors or elders' wives, as you care for your husbands, as you deal, as you sadly at times have to put up with them being out of the house for maybe five, six evenings in a week as different needs crop up in the church at different points. Do we as a church pray for the elders here? Are you praying for Bernie and me? Do you pray for the elders that might yet be here, the pastors that we might yet have? Do, do you pray for the young men growing up in the church that, 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 that the Lord might even raise them up to be elders here or in other places? Do we pray for you know, the Lord to give to us further gifts of leadership here? I hope we are. Because this is such an area that is really serious and important. Because if the, if, if the leadership of the church, if the elders of a church start deviating from God's word, if they start you know, drifting off, if they come under particular sustained periods of, sort of spiritual attack or depression, it will end up having an impact on the life of the church. No, we want those who are going to act as shepherds, watching over the church rightly, carefully, gently leading in the correct ways but doing so under God for his glory among the people then secondly we have uh, deacons there are many things aren't there that are needed in order for a church to function uh, it's more than just turning up here on a Sunday morning and opening the doors and hoping that everybody fills in and you know, that somebody at some point has switched the, the urn on in the kitchen for there to be some tea and coffee after the services and hey that'd be it you know that'd be that would be good wouldn't it there's lots of things in order for a church to function there is understandably spiritual and practical stuff 
And whilst the elders are predominantly to look after the, pr- the spiritual stuff, not exclusively, the deacons, we're told, are, suppo- are, are primarily to be concerned with the, the practical stuff. Uh, over the years, there's been a huge debate as to whether deacons lead in a church or whether they serve in a church. The answer is both. They lead as they serve. That's the picture that I think we see here in the passage. That there is going, they're going to be actively involved in helping the church as they serve among the church. The word deacon itself just means servant. You didn't know we had servants, did you? But we do. We, we have five uh, servants at the church here. Uh, and I bet you probably don't necessarily expect, really know what they get up to. Although those of you who are married to them know that they end up having at times really long meetings that finish late into the night because there's lots of practical things to consider. The deacons, again, similarly, when you look from verse 8 onwards, are supposed to be men of good character. In fact, actually, they are given almost exactly the same stringent qualifications as elders. Why? Because it's, it's, it's a character trait of people who genuinely truly, faithfully love the Lord Jesus. But there are some distinctions. Uh, In Acts chapter 6, we don't have time to turn to it this morning, but Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, uh, we find there that the apostles, the elders, uh, are struggling to meet all the care needs of the church, and they say to the church, we need to appoint men to care practically for the fellowship. And it is the church who then vote to approve six men to care practically for the church. That is the primary function of deacons, to, and that's where the principle comes from, to serve in the church. Now, they are obviously gifted men. You look at the, the list of men there, and you've got Stephen, who we're told is full of the Spirit. There's Philip, who's known as the evangelist, who, who was used in, to, to, in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, they're, they're, they're wonderfully gifted men, but they're gifted especially for the practical things. And that's what we see as an implication here from verse 8 onwards, or in 1 Timothy 3. It's why we're told there in verse 10 that they are first to be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Uh, again, this is a, a role that people are appointed to because they're doing it, not because we hope that they will step into doing it. We aren't, though, told that they need to be, uh, that they can't be a recent uh, Christian, but that they need to be tested. Is there, a, is there character right? Is there an aptitude for this? Is not only that there an aptitude, but is there a willingness? Because that plays a large part in it. Someone who is willing to do the role. You need time and availability and a willingness and a character all to match up for someone to be considered to be appointed to that role. And then we're told there in verse 10, again, not only test them, but let them serve as deacons. Let them get on with doing the role of caring for the church, of doing the practical things among the fellowship. That doesn't mean that the only people who can sweep up after a Sunday morning are the deacons, or the only ones who can open up the church building are the deacons, or the only ones who can think about financial matters or or, or things of the church are the deacons. No. No, We use different gifts, don't we? And we serve one another and we're engaged in things here as a church with each other. But predominantly the the deacons do look after the, the legal, the financial, the the very practical cares of the building, even the practical care at times of among the fellowship. Organising rotors and sorting out all kinds of things like that that seem to just happen and pop up and everything keeps functioning here, which we're very thankful for. And we, we can be thankful for the faithful men that we have here, here serving as deacons amongst us. And the reason why we know they're faithful is that most of the time nothing goes wrong. And we don't walk up or turn up on a Sunday and find that the doors of the building are hanging off, that everything's in a complete state of disrepair. 
We don't find the church being slapped with a load of legal fines because we've you know, neglected our responsibilities here within the UK government and within charity law and all kinds of other things like that, although we generally wish that we didn't have to worry about thinking about some of them. You know, the role of the deacons uh, is something that is often overlooked, but it is vital for the good functioning and order of the church. That's actually how they display a leadership. They display, their, their, or rather, their leadership is seen in that as they serve humbly and faithfully before us and amongst us, that actually that is the pattern of all service. Humble, faithful, quietly going on with Jesus, doing what we're called, gifted and equipped to do. Probably the more challenging bit, I think, in verse 11 is when we start talking about, Paul starts saying there, and the women are to be worthy of respect. You know, OK, Paul, what women are we meaning here? And again, there's been immense debate over the years as to whether this is talking about uh, deacons' wives is this talking about female deacons, deaconesses, although that word isn't used here? Or is this just talking about women who, who have a role in serving among the fellowship and caring for those in there, and they support the deacons in that? And I think there's probably a degree of a hybrid here. And I think this is probably a case of that these are women who have been spoken about here in verse 11, who might not necessarily be officially recognised in, ch- in the church as a deacon, but they're women who are active in caring for the church, the women who you ask to, to be involved in, in, in different ministries, the women who, who are going to be involved in, in running and, and supporting and caring on each other, those who are, who are particularly looked up to in the men at fellowship, who are they going to be? They're the women who are worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, they're not gossips, they're not busybodies, but they're temperate and they're trustworthy in everything. The thing is, you don't actually even need to be called a deacon to serve in the church. Deacons have a particular role and function. The truth is, everybody to some extent should be serving within the church. We all have gifts given to us by God to serve to some capacity within the church. You don't need an official title to be involved in the life of the fellowship here. You don't need someone to give a rubber stamp of approval or a vote to be made in a members meeting in order for you to be engaged. We do ask, though, make certain requirements that that, that it is members who run and lead ministries. A member is someone who's been who's formally committed to to serving the life of the fellowship here. They're a baptized believer. It's them that are going to be given opportunities, especially. The reason is because we're all called to serve together. Those who are recognised as deacons amongst us, they they show themselves faithful deacons as they continue to do what they've been entrusted to do faithfully. And and as I said, it's not something that we always see or are aware of, but we thank the Lord uh, for them and should do. And then thirdly, and and just very briefly, we need to think about the church together. How how does then the church function with with elders and deacons in place? Well, as I said, elders are supposed to lead. They are the ones that are supposed to make the spiritual decisions for the church. They are supposed to uh, give instruction and encouragement. Uh, and they are to introduce and to restrict things at different times. For the good of the church, they have spiritual accountability to Jesus for the things that they do. The deacons, well, we're not told that quite so much in the same way. And there obviously is going to be a listening and a, and a watchfulness uh, as these diligent, uh, faithful individuals uh, consider together before the Lord what is right for us as a church to do. That's why in, in members' meetings we have proposals from elders or deacons at different times about the different elements of things that we need to vote on. But it isn't ever a case is that elders or pastors in a church should be swanning around demanding everything and getting their own way. Uh, there's a gentleman that contacted us a number of months back 
about looking at the thinking the role uh, about the role here and he told me that if he came into the church here it would be his church and we would all have to do exactly what he said well before i could say we're not the church for you he actually said i don't think i can work with you and hung up on me i did think about calling him back up but i decided not to the thing is, the church isn't a place for one person to come in with a power platform seeking to create a name or a, or a title for themselves. The church is supposed to all move towards the Lord Jesus. The church is supposed to be united around Christ and his word. But there is a particular place of authority that, that we find here in Timothy that the elders are to have among the church. Just have a look at it. Flick your eyes over in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and have a look at verse 17. This is how the church are supposed to think about and relate to, in some measure, the elders of a church. We told them 5.17 that the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honour, especially those who work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle the, an oxen while he's treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder and that is, unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. For those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. Paul says, where there are elders who serve well, this is how the church, how should the church view them? The church should view them with honour, just as we honoured and delighted in Ian's good care of the church over the years. That's right. It is right that the elders are looked to that there is, if there are questions, spiritual questions, that you come and talk with us. You know our contact details, you know how to get in touch with us. We're not mind readers. We would love to be able to help and support different ones in the fellowship. The elders are supposed to be something, but there is, it doesn't, but, but Paul does acknowledge that the elders aren't always perfect. If there is something that the elders are doing that is an elder that is doing is sinful. Actually, the first principle is Matthew chapter 18. If someone is sinning, you go and talk with them personally. Now, if you feel that a pastor or elder is doing something in the church that isn't right here, what do you do, first of all? You talk with them. Don't send them an email. Don't go and talk with their wife. Go and talk with them. That is the correct way to do things. And then, subsequently, if there are then further problems and things not being resolved, you go and talk to the other elders of the church and say, here is an issue. And then it is the elders then who deal with that together in there in verse 20. And they are the ones with the church in a broader setting who would then rebuke a, a, an elder or pastor who might be doing things wrong. But Timothy is very clear that, isn't he? He says in verse 19, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Don't just go on hearsay. There is supposed to be a care. And that's a very, oh, that's a clear principle and something that applies in any accusations against any other believer, by the way, that there is a care in the way that things are viewed. There's a sense if, in which the, the, the decisions that the elders make should be listened to, and in most cases will probably be followed by the membership. Why? Because there should be a right prayerfulness and consulting with the word, a concern of the people here. You know, Peter really interestingly says there in 1 Peter 5 that they are to pass to the flock among you. Peter says to the elders, don't think about the church that you wish they were. Don't think about the characters that you wish you had or the gifts that you wish you had in the church or the, or the church that you might be able to think about in your head as you're sat in your study during the week preparing. He says, pass the flock who are among you. Actually, if you want to help us as elders and teachers here in the church to look after you, if we ask to come and see you, don't panic. It might be that we just want to come and spend time with you to help us get a gauge of where the fellowship are. So that we can make sure that what we teach on a Sunday, what we say in the Bible studies, the way that we look at the ministries and the structure of the church, that it is designed for the good of the church and for you. It means turn up on a Sunday. Because 
the ministry is designed with you as a fellowship at heart. It's one of the hardest things each week, sitting down and thinking, what does this passage do for us? How does this apply to where we are? And it might not hit for you every single week in exactly the spot that you feel like you need it. But it will together, collectively, over time, build up to a bigger picture to help you understand what it looks like to live for God faithfully in different times and situations. Maybe this morning you're someone and you're looking at things and you say, well, actually, I I do. I love the thought of being an elder or a deacon at some point in the church where there's no sign-up list. What we do have as a responsibility, as a membership especially, is to consider those who are amongst us. Are there any who are already doing and showing these signs and the qualities of someone who could be an elder or a deacon? Are they displaying these gifts to some measure already? Are we praying for the Lord to raise up future elders and leaders and deacons and other ministry leaders even here within the church? We, those of us who are in response, places, positions of responsibility actually would we look to encourage those who show some potential or promise or might need development or maybe even many years ahead, but giving thought to that. One of the things we we often consider is what are the gifts that God has given amongst us? Can we recognise them and and see, in that sense, God's good care and hand among us? says churches are supposed to they're going to be local they they work in local areas there's no national international organization that you that we go to the church works in local places together for the sake of the gospel and there are those that god particularly gifts and appoints within the church from within the church to serve amongst and watch over the fellowship and the dealings there we can give thanks to god for the gifts that we see at present amongst us we can continue to pray uh, and ask that God would, would show his good hand to us again in providing for us all that we have need of in terms of leadership and direction so that as a church together we might continue in a healthy way serving him and being uh, having our hearts directed towards the Lord Jesus more and more. We're going to stand and sing.